Welcome. Uh, my name is Łukasz Szczepański. I'm currently working as an Agile coach uh, at Tensquare Games. Uh, I'm helping the teams and the company become more effective through iterative development, hypothesis, and data-based product approach, and some of the tools you'll hear about today, among the others. Uh, in the last 15 years, my time was roughly equally split between game development and business and uh, corporations. While my heart is with game dev, a change of scenery allowed me to find a wider perspective, learn more about processes and challenges with building technology and working in really large teams. Sometimes I meet with people who think that game development is the bee's knees, the pinnacle of software and product engineering. The fact is that this might be true for singular teams and companies, but overall, the industries are not that different and each has their own challenges. Uh, when you're in one company and one industry for a long time, you might think that you've seen it all. But that's just a narrow perspective, a Dunning-Kruger effect, if you will. Games are just software, and they're a product and a service as well. My talk today will take you through some tools and concepts used in business, which are widely applicable to game development as well. The aim of this talk is to change your thinking a bit and give you tips how to plan product development better. I hope that you walk out of this with a slightly wider perspective. Uh, the talk is titled Outcome-Based Roadmaps. And what we'll talk about today uh, is what roadmaps are and what they're not, and what are the common misconceptions uh, regarding the roadmaps. Then we'll move to a central topic of how to distinguish between, between outcomes and outputs. And finally, I will walk you through some examples of such a roadmap. Roadmaps, uh, we all use them, love them, hate them. They're usually pretty central to every product organization. Some of you most likely use roadmaps, which look like this. Looks very standard, right? Uh, I think that from product plan, uh, it's one of their example pictures. It's nice and colorful and very detailed. Take a minute to review the slide and try to find an answer to these questions. What is this company trying to do? Is there an overarching strategy that you can see here? How will they change the lives of their customers? And how will the product be different when they're done? If you can, if you can pause the video uh, and review the plan. I think we can all agree that they're doing something uh, and have a pretty detailed plan for the next three quarters. There are three teams, uh, which probably have some kind of dependencies and common goals, but it's really hard to figure out from this picture. Some of you have noticed uh, that there are some goals there as well. And that's how we're color coding the bars. Great, except it's not. What does the enhanced performance actually mean? If they move the benchmark by 1%, is that okay? Or maybe 20% is still not enough? What exactly will happen uh, with those goals? I guess we'll never know. As you can see, everything is laid out uh, neatly on the timeline. Uh, it gives us that great feeling of order, the feeling of control. Our OCD is now at ease. Things are neat and tidy. There are dates. Everything is also coupled so tightly. One day we go, we're doing third-party integration, and the next day we're already doing on-premise backup and self-service portal at the same time. After all, third-party integrations are usually very predictable, right? Those of you who have doubled uh, a bit in engineering have probably seen a chart from the next slide. The accuracy of estimation. As you can see, the accuracy can differ by a magnitude of four, depending on how well we know the issue. Whether we've done the feasibility study, whether we've learned what the problem we're solving, or whether we've done any prototyping of the solution. Yet, with our colorful roadmap, we make a massive nine-month plan where everything is buttoned up already in January. We know how things will go, we know what we'll deliver and when, 
everything in quarter two and three is hinging on whether quarter one will go well. It's such a beautiful plan. Now I would like to offer you a metaphor from a skilled observer of the human psyche and the commentator of reality and business, none other than Monty Python and the Olympic Games. As you can see, various teams are lining up to deliver your yearly plan. A new quarter starts and they're off. Well, I guess this is where everyone expects uh, a quote from Helmut von Moltke, Eisenhower or Churchill, but I will not entertain you with a different quote from another strategist. He says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. His name is Mike Tyson. We have inherited a production approach from our predecessors where everything is defined in detail upfront before we start building anything. And for the last 20 years, we're trying to move away from it with different results. Whenever you build a detailed plan, it crumbles as soon as you change anything. This means that a single change can cascade into a multitude of changes, each kicking off a chain reaction. Tracking this where it is unnecessary is really wasteful and counterproductive. So where am I going with this? It's not about how we execute it, how we execute, because we learn to optimize the production pipelines pretty well, for the most part at least, it's about what we execute. Take a look. Behold the planning onion, a concept well, pretty, pretty well known. On this magnificent, magnificent onion, I like to draw a line somewhere here. In many industries and companies, we plan everything below this line. We discuss stuff in teams below this line. We go into details below this line. But wait, the roadmap is above the line. It is. It actually is. Because what we've been looking at so far were not roadmaps. And we'll get to that part soon enough. There are two levels to the onion. The first one is the strategy. What is our vision and how do we want to achieve that vision? The second level is delivery. What exactly and when are we going to build in order to walk the roadmaps? Unfortunately, this is, the, this is the level where most of our energy goes into and the level where we start planning. We focus on what we're supposed to do, not on what needs to be done. We're often in this 20th century factory mentality where more work done equals better value. Uh, let's look at another great example of business commentary. This time it's South Park and the underpant gnomes. Damn, dude, this place is huge. Yeah, it's almost as big as Carmen's ass. <laughs> no, it isn't, you guys. This is where all our work is done. So what are you going to do with all these underpants that you steal? Collecting underpants is just phase one. Phase one, collect underpants. So what's phase two? Hey, what's phase two? Phase one, we collect underpants. Yeah, 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 but what about phase two? Well, phase three is profit, get it? I don't get it. You see, phase one, collect underpants. Phase two, phase three, profit. Oh, I get it. No, you don't, fat ass. Do you guys know anything about corporations? You bet we do. Us gnomes are geniuses at corporations. Jesus Christ, look out! Oh my God, they killed Kenny. You best. Does this seem familiar? Especially in game development, we have a great idea and a hunch that it will make money. We just aren't sure how. That doesn't stop us from developing it, though, does it? Peter Drucker, one of the founders of Modern Management, uh, once said that there is nothing so useless as doing efficiently what should not be done at all. Think about this. This is the reason we're depart departing from the waterfall methodology. We want to maximize the amount of work not being done. Let's look at some templates of thinking that got us here. As humans, engineers, and creatives, we have the urge to find solutions to a problem almost instantly. Where there is a problem, 
we try to fix its symptoms as soon as possible. And that is the key culprit here. We're addressing the surface level issues. We're thinking, we're fixing symptoms. We really drill down to understand what is the root cause. The once popular five whys don't seem that popular anymore. We don't apply concepts like design thinking to our products because we think we're so good uh, at the cutting edge of technology, mobile and game development. We have terabytes of telemetry flowing down from customers every day. The challenge here is that the data is showing us what is happening. It doesn't tell us why. As you can see from those examples, uh, there, there is a, a very big difference between trying to help people to better use our product and a backlog item says saying new UI on the landing page. They might be doing similar things, but it's it's the approach and how we think about it that is that is very different and and valuable here. Uh, you've probably heard of Simon Sinek and his uh, golden circle. I think it's important to reiterate what, what he said. We really discuss why are we doing things. We're stuck in the what and being busy. We're optimizing resource allocation and we're keeping everyone busy. Don't go that way. Uh, understanding what your product is, why you're doing it, who is the beneficiary of the solution is really important. Producing more is not the solution. Talk with your teams about why you're doing that step, this feature or, or this element. They will surprise you with, with results. Finally, we're getting close to the point of the stock, outputs versus outcomes. This is an example to better picture these concepts. Andre is a programmer. He does coding. He creates a popular mobile game feature the Wheel of Fortune. Because of this, players come back to the game more often, which in turn affects our KPIs. Looks pretty, pretty solid, right? However, in this scenario, the output is our phase one and the impact is phase three. The outcomes are sort of implied. We hope that players will do what we need them to do because of our feature. In my opinion, uh, a better approach is actually the reverse. First, we must figure out why do we want to make a change? What kind of goal do we want to reach? If that is that goal measurable? If yes, then what are the break-even and target measures? Then we brainstorm what kind of new player behavior or what changes in their behavior would cause us to reach those goals. Finally, we must research which features or product changes can potentially trigger the desired changes in the behavior. This is sort of a light impact mapping, if you will. At the, at the end, we've built a focus plan of making a meaningful business change in order to reach our goals. Let's define what the outcomes are. They are a measurable change in someone's behavior that the customers, the personas that we're working with will do things differently. They might start or stop doing certain activities and that's a change too. Uh, if you're planning a change and your outcome is the customer buys my product, then that is not a change unless no customers buy your product yet. Try to broaden your view. Maybe they could buy it more often or earlier or they could buy it for their friends. To picture that better, uh, let's go through some examples. One of my favorite anti-patterns is the, the first item here on the top left, new payments implementation. I've seen this in more teams and organizations that I would want to admit. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's very, very common. So let's dissect this. The implementation is an activity. I'm implementing something. It's not specified whether it's good or bad or valuable. I'm just doing it. Activities should never be set 
as any kind of goals. In contrast, let's let's look at the at the first green one. Players can pay for items faster. There is a change here. They could pay for items before, but because of the changes we're implementing, the result would be buying faster. That's a gain and value for the end customer. Notice the numerous features here, like Wheel of Fortune, Social 2.0, Collectible System. They are all outputs. If we don't look into our design docs or impact maps, we won't have any idea what these are supposed to do. It's really hard to say what the change will be because the only say, the only thing we're saying is, hey, here's a feature. Let's start to define success. What do we want to achieve? What, what success is? For some of you, execution of a plan will be a success. Maybe that's the fault of, of your environment. For some, it will be shipping a feature. And for some, shipping it on time. Maybe there are some engineering challenges there. Hard to say. Some organizations and people will think about starting something as a success. Possibly you're bogged down by rigid procedures and bureaucracy. For me, Success of a company or a product is to reach the business goals. All the previous items will be successes depending on the maturity of your organization. But if you look closely, these are just activities, means to an end. That end is making a change in the world, in the business, moving forward. Let's go back to our planning union uh, to put all of this together. Vision is where we're going. What is our target state? The roadmap will show us which way we want to go there, which problems we decide to solve out of the plethora of available options. The release planning will help us to define steps to resolve a problem. We'll choose a specific solution. Finally, we'll be making plans for the next sprint and the next day. Everyone involved in product development from the sponsor to the intern tester must be aware of this at all times. This is why sprint review meetings in Scrum are valuable. We, ver we verify that we do the right thing for the business every sprint. I like, to go I like to go through the whole onion at the beginning of each review to remind everyone why we're here and why are we doing this product. It really brings the, the big picture to, to your team. So now let's go back to our initial chart. As you might suspect, this is not an actual roadmap. This is a release plan at best, showing what specific items will be developed. Don't mistake this for strategy. And the goals there in the lower right well, these are more themes than goals. Goals need to be specific and measurable. Look up smart goals to learn more. The chart here shows the basic differences between roadmaps and release plans. Roadmaps are a high level communication tool, which allows us to communicate to stakeholders what we're doing and most importantly, why. Maybe we shouldn't be doing things if we do them for the wrong reasons. Roadmaps show us the long-term journey and assumptions. In contrast, the release plan is focused on the here and now. It's focused on delivery. It should be used internally by the teams to coordinate their work, plan resources and time. It shows what exactly needs to be done by whom and when. The key difference between them is the separation of strategy from execution. Roadmaps should show our product challenges and ideas, hypotheses, uh, which we want to test in order to deal with these challenges. They allow us to prioritize ideas based on the problems being resolved and value being potentially created. Roadmaps are a product tool and they're relatively simple because of their high level. While roadmaps are product tools, release plans are an engineering or delivery tool and a very detailed one too. 
they focus solely on execution, how to make it smooth and predictable, how to make it efficient. And why do we need to have these separate, you ask? Well, because you simply can't use the same tool to answer the questions whether John and Paul can build the feature in five days, while also figuring out if the persona of adventurous Karen will find it appealing and how much revenue can potentially grow. These are just simply very different things. Finally, we arrive on some examples of how an objective-based roadmap might look like. This is straight from Melissa Perry's website. If you don't follow her, start now. If you can, pause the video now and take a couple of minutes to review this roadmap. It's pretty rich in content and it will make the following commentary uh, much better for you. First thing that we can see is the format. <clears throat> Gone are the colorful bars, assignments and all hallmarks of a release plan. Instead, we have a different structure cutting through the top layers of the planning onion. First, there's an overarching vision of the product. Where do we want to be in three years? Then we have the challenge for this year, which is very, very ambitious. Finally, there, there's a clear goal or target condition for this quarter. It says what the change will be and quantifies it with numbers. Below, we have the work divided into themes. Notice that these are themes not features. Each theme has its own hypothesis and a desired outcome. In the first example, they're aiming to decrease the time to find proper insurance plans. The filtering they mention in the hypothesis is just one of the ideas. What is important is that we reach the desired outcome. If we'll figure out a feature other than filtering, which would allow us to, to do that, all the better. That's why if you, these are themes, we need to find a solution to a problem, not implement a solution. Near the bottom, you will find the status, which tells us some very important information. What are we doing with that area? Is it in delivery or do we still research it? Whether the problem has been validated and whether the solution to the problem has been validated. You see, what you think the customer's problem is might not be their problem at all. There's something to think about here. Finally, the priority. As you will notice, there's only one number one priority. If you ever find yourself having more than one top priority or more than one item at high or critical, it's time to do some soul searching and change that. Let's review the outcomes here. Outcome for each theme is a change in a behavior and is quantified. There are clear goals to achieve, which are a guiding light for that particular theme. This allows you to have important and creative discussions and a clear rally point. Don't underestimate setting them. In this example, one thing to notice are the time horizons instead of priority. You will notice that there, are, there aren't too many either. Just things we're doing now, things planned next, which is roughly six months, and then everything else in the future packet. The future is always in motion. So there's little point in having everything detailed so far away. Of course, that depends on your context, but usually a rough idea of the future is just enough. This roadmap has everything you need to know about where the product is going. There's the vision, the yearly goal, themes in which we operate, and then there are specific and measurable outcomes we want to achieve. Notice how simple this is. Just a few boxes. If you need to change anything, it's easily done. Compare this to our Gantt-like charts where you would need to reschedule multiple items with each change. With quarterly approach, you have some leeway to move things around. One thing that might be going through the heads of some of you is probably, all right, but my stuff doesn't start and end perfectly in a quarter. How does that help me? As we remember from the Agile Manifesto, working software is the primary measure of progress. Thus, what we're showing here with the roadmap is when these things will become available according to your definition of done. 
let's be honest, the customers don't really care how long or how hard we have worked. They're looking for valuable software and they're willing to pay for it. It's up to you and your engineering team to figure out the scheduling details, but that's the job for the release plan. The product roadmap shows us where we're taking the product and what value will it bring. Now, let's see how it all ties together. At the top uh, of this great tree, um, you can see that we have the product vision, which is guided by our principle, principles and desired business impacts. This begins the strategy part. Then we set certain goals to reach, goals which will be the stepping stones towards reaching our vision. You can use smart goals or OKRs here to make it structured better. In order to reach the goals, certain outcomes need to happen. A change in the environment is required. Again, SMART can help you with setting tightly defined outcomes. To bring these outcomes into existence, we need to look for opportunities in the market. Opportunities, to put it simply, are underserved needs of our customers. This is where the product discovery phase begins. Once we understand what their needs are, what the requirements are, we can move to the ideation exercise where we're creating hypotheses and experiments which will help us to validate the solutions. Some ideas will fail, while some will become solutions to opportunities. And now the delivery part begins. We can define features based on validated solutions and then further break them into smaller user stories and deliver as usual. Compare this to a world where we were in a feature factory, operating only on the two lowest levels, trying to make as many features as possible, where we thought that we were so efficient because we were so busy. There's much, much more to product development than just inventing features. There is a whole validation process prior to creating new functionality. The whole point of the Agile approach is that we gain speed, not because we magically learn to code faster, but because we build the right thing for the right people and verify our, verify our approach uh, in regular intervals. One final tip for this tree, once you come up with solid goals, you can try to use the impact mapping method to fill in the other levels. You will still need to verify the solutions, but it should give you the scaffolding to work with your product. Let's recap. What benefits do the outcome-based roadmaps bring to the table? They clearly lay out what our vision is, making the vision easily accessible in the whole company. We know which outcomes we're after. The goals are both clear and measurable. We transparently indicate the assumptions and, and hypothesis. We're, we're in uncharted territory and it doesn't hurt to say clearly that we're experimenting and that there's possibility of learning from experience. What we want to build to reach our goals. And finally, what would be the, the rough next steps? For me, this is the way. The teams and product managers who embrace this approach are much happier, focused, and their products are performing better. Uh, finally, I would like to leave you with some reading material. Uh, the first one is Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry, uh, where you will learn uh, more about why just building is not enough. Then you have Impact Mapping by uh, Goiko Ajit, which will help you to create impact maps and find a more focused way to reach your goals. And finally, the continuous discovery habits by Teresa Torres uh, will guide you through opportunity solution trees, similar to one uh, you've seen previously and some other interesting concepts. That's all folks. Uh, thank you for tuning in for my talk. Hopefully I've added some spice to your product approach. Feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and share experiences how this has worked or why this has not worked for you. I'm always happy to learn and discuss. Until next time, bye.